Hi, this is Brennan Davis from Bedrock Games and the Bedrock Blog, and today I'm talking about William Butler. Uh, it's the 10th anniversary of his death. He died in 2014 on September 3rd. Um, I, I'm sure a lot of you know, but many don't. Uh, when I started Bedrock Games, it was with Bill, and he was my business partner. And so, uh, you know, up through 2014, it was him and me, and then we later brought in Dan, uh, I think in 2012, when we started working on Sartorius. But when we started, it was it was me and Bill, and, uh, you know, obviously we had people in our groups that would come in and play test with us, but we would, you know, we would have regular meetings and all that stuff. And he was also uh, a very good friend of mine. We met through gaming. I think I met him in, like, 1997 or something. I forget the exact year I met him. Um, but it was, I believe, during a Ravenloft game I was running. And I think somebody brought him in as a player. Um, and he was part of a group that we used to call the Tuesday group that I would play in um, and he and I would play in a lot of campaigns but we became very quick friends for whatever reason he was just somebody that I clicked with very quickly um, and so I you know I didn't really know what to do uh, for the 10th year anniversary uh, number one it's surprising it's been that long it doesn't feel like it's been that long of a time and it's it's also it, it's it's now been so long that um, you know, I sometimes worry that uh, his contribution to Bedrock Games is is not remembered as well. So I, I always try to make a point of doing this every year, um, and I I think about him a lot. Uh, so it, you know, it's it, it's one of these things where I feel like, um, and this is just my opinion, but I feel like in the gaming community sometimes we're not very good at talking about death for whatever reason. I remember when he died, and I would mention it to people; they would change the subject very quickly. Um, I didn't have that experience outside gaming circles. Um, I, I, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, um, but it, it often makes me worry that his um, his memory won't be won't won't that he won't be as remembered as long as he should be, um, because he was a really important part of Bedrock Games, uh, and he was also somebody who I mean, just to list off some qualities that I always admired in him, he, his knowledge of RPGs was encyclopedic. Um, he, he would he, he seemed to know every game that ever existed he knew what was unique about that game what it made what made it click mechanically but he would also always tell you what could be done to improve it and he always saw games as sort of just all having these tools that he could draw on and clutch to something else for whatever purpose he wanted he was kind of like a mechanic and he was the mechanics guy he was the guy that um, really uh, was responsible for the game being so streamlined when we made it when I made Strange Tales of Song Ling, which was after his death, uh, you know, by, by a number of years, I, I made it trying to make a game that I thought he would appreciate. And so that was why that was so stripped down, um, because his whole thing when we were working on Network originally was stripping everything down, getting it streamlined. And I'm sure he could have taken, he would have probably taken it further than we even took it. Uh, you know, but there was a balance between me and him and also everything in the playtest. So for Strange Tales of Song Ling, I just went as far as I could in that direction. Um, and, uh, you know, another thing that, you know, was connected to this is that he just had a lot of knowledge in general. Um, I, I really started to realize how much I learned from Bill uh, recently, just in terms of, you, you know, if you had a conversation with him and a topic came up, he would know a lot about it. And a lot of times it would be geek related. So, you know, there'd be a lot of things about comic books or games or whatever. But it would also be stuff like World War II battles and, you know, military history and all these things. And I remember like, you know, one time talking to him about how my grandfather was at the Battle of the Bulge. And he just he immediately just started talking about everything about the Battle of the Bulge. And I, I knew almost nothing about it. I, I, I like history, but I'm not big on battles and military history and I found it fascinating that he were, that he knew all this and that he remembered the details so well and I think it was because he used to read World War II magazines I could be wrong um, I, I'm sure he read a lot of other stuff too but I remember him mentioning specifically talking about World War II magazines and it just always impressed me um, and I always came away learning something and recently uh, somebody was talking about the D&D monk and where that came from and they mentioned the Destroyer series which is what the um, the Remo Williams movie was based on and I instantly knew what they were talking about not because I had read the book and I had <laughs> I'd seen the movie like ages ago and I hadn't really thought of it until Bill mentioned the Destroyer books but he was a fan of the series 
and he would talk about it all the time and I basically learned the whole plot of the it's like having somebody explain all of James Bond to you um, and so I decided to pick up The Destroyer. Uh, the first book is called Created the Destroyer. It's by Warren Murphy and Richard Saper. Um, the first books, I guess, my understanding is as the line went on, and, and I should emphasize, Bill was not, in my opinion, a conservative, but the, the books have a more conservative bent, and they kind of become a... Um, uh, like like their, their villains in their books, which are kind of similar to James Bond villains in a lot of way, ways, are... Um, are often like parodies of of left wing groups and things like that, and so. Uh, but I don't think that was why he liked the book. I think he liked it because it's funny. There's a lot of humor in the books, and uh, the main uh, the main character is taught by this guy named Chun, and that's where all the D and D monk stuff. Not all of it, but a lot of it comes from from Chun and from this character and the the kind of training that he had. This is the kind of thing where like they're able to dodge bullets, that sort of thing. Um, and I think they do that in the Remo Williams movie, if I remember. Um, but he would he would talk about the plot of the book and I and and it, it, and I had never read it but I and so when it came up I was like oh I know that story so I decided to read the first book as you know the anniversary date uh, for Bill's passing was coming up and it was a it was a really nice experience number one the first book isn't as um, uh, it, it it doesn't it, it, it's a little bit more grounded is my impression than the later books and I haven't read the later books yet so I don't really know. And if I get anything wrong about them, people can certainly feel free to weigh in. Because the first book's pretty grounded. Um, and, you know, it kind of has sort of like a James Bond meets... I, I want to say Death Wish, even though the plot isn't really about that kind of stuff. But it's kind of got a James Bond meets Death Wish sort of vibe. It's definitely like an American version of James Bond, in my opinion. Um, and it, it's a really riveting read. Like, it was... It, it, it was it, the book's only like a hundred and... I don't know, the version I have is like a hundred and seventy pages... I read it in like a day. Uh, it reads really quickly. The, the, the main character is interesting. The concept behind it is interesting. And the uh, uh, and it comes from that, I always call it the karate is magic era, where we just attributed all of these fantastical things to martial arts. If, if, if you know, From dodging bullets to being able to hold your breath for four hours. Like all these, you know, amazing feats that are superhuman. We, you know... Were, were possible in the world of martial arts to us from about 1970 to, I don't know, the early 90s maybe, up until about the UFC. Um, and in fact, Bill was a, a big fan of the UFC as well. Um, but, but yeah, I don't know. I, 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 saw, I, saw, I saw the humor that, uh, that, that Bill, Bill had for it. And, and again, this is, a, um, this is a later printing, so I don't know if this is in the versions that Bill read, but in the foreword... The, the character Chun is warning you like that the book is full of lies and it's, it's just a very it's got a very amusing framework um, but yeah so I felt like it was nice because I got a chance to kind of connect with something I remember Bill talking with me about and so I, I really enjoyed that um, and, and I watched the Remo William movie again which was better than I remembered there's obviously stuff in there that's very dated um, and I won't get into it you can look it up and find out for yourself but there's a Statue of Liberty sequence that I definitely remember. That's like the one thing from the movie I remember. And it was really impressive. I kind of remembered it being more hokey, but the, the physical action in it was, was actually quite good. Um, and it's really just sort of towards the end where it kind of doesn't quite hold up as much, I think, as the beginning. But the first, the first like, you know, three-fourths of the movie are actually pretty decent. It bombed. It bombed really bad at the box office. And I... I think the reason why is nobody knew who Remo Williams was. Um, I, I remember uh, when it came out, having I had I, I thought it was part of some kind of ongoing series that I didn't have access to, which was true. But I didn't realize it was a book series. I thought it was like a connected to some kind of movie series. But I remember it must have aired on HBO or something because I remember seeing it. Um, and so, yeah, it was a I don't know it was an interesting interesting read, and that was the kind of thing that you. Um, that you got from the, you just get all of these like, you know, like cultural references and pop culture references and gaming reference, all these things that he had just absorbed and he and he kind of soaked them up like a sponge. Um, it was I, you know, I was just always learning a lot from him, um, and I still try to like, you know, I, I still try to. Uh, it's complicated because when somebody passes away, 
they're not able to develop anymore. So he, there's a lot of things that have happened in the gaming scene that I don't know how he would react to. Do you know what I mean? So, and I don't want to make assumptions about how Bill would react because he wasn't always predictable. He, uh, um, you know, he 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 could be uh, he, he could be surprising sometimes. So I don't know what his response would be. Uh, I know he was very he was the one of us who really discovered the OSR. He he was the one who introduced me to it. He found Lamentations of the Flame Princess, and he thought it was this it was just this revelation to him that you could take the old D and D stuff and kind of put your own twist on it and go in a different direction. And so he got really into OSR. He played everything. He was in like three or four gaming groups every week so he had like a 4e game a 3e game he had he played everything um and he played all kinds of systems um he knew he knew he knew he was really into harn for example um but he was also a very interesting person to have conversations with i miss uh he's the kind of person that even though he could have like very strong views about things he was always very open-minded and he would engage you with an argument um that would challenge you but would also um, be open to the points you were making so like just as an example like a major difference between us is he was he was a very staunch atheist and I am not an atheist I, I definitely believe in a God and so we had two very opposing views but we had some very interesting discussions um, I remember in particular uh, it was always fascinating. If, like we would we, inevitably, these conversations often turned to things like the unmoved mover argument and things like that. And I, I don't know. I just remember having these these like hours long conversations with him about that. And you know, we get sort of the, the point where we would ultimately have our disagreement was around the idea of the infinite regress. And um, and you know, as you might imagine. Uh, Bill took the position that um, you know that that that's just another uh, uh, that, 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 that you you know you're ju- you're just you're just you're just sort of creating an excuse by saying that you know there's this unmoved mover um, and so you know it's, you're creating sort of like a magical explanation um, but it was great I remember I, I heard that you know I'm, I'm from Boston and so there was a, um, there's a comedian named Bill Burr from here and he was talking about the passing of Patrice O'Neill. And how one of the things that he's, he's amazed by is how he still has arguments in his head with Patrice O'Neill. And I find I still have these debates with Bill in my head in, in a good way, not in a bad way. Um, and, and also, like, I carry some of his arguments with me when I'm thinking these through myself. So it's, I don't know, it, uh, he was somebody who had a, a, a very big impact on me. Um, and it was a real shock when he died. Uh, it was a very surprising event. Um, we kind of, I mean, I think there were signs that it was coming. He was, he was complaining of being tired and things like that. And so, uh, he didn't have the healthiest diet. Um, but I don't think anybody expected, you know, he was, he was not that old. Uh, he was 46 years old. So he was, he was, he was, you know, really young. Uh, you know, again, people do have heart attacks at that age. That's also why I'm so, um, sometimes I'll, maybe to the point of annoyance, be pr- promoting health <laughs> in gaming discussions. It's just that because I've been, uh, I've had the experience of seeing one of my very good friends die who, who, who maybe wouldn't have if he had had a healthier diet and he had gone to the doctor more. Um, and that's not to blame him. Um, he was a really good guy. And I know that my sense is one of the reasons why he didn't go to the doctor is he was terrified and I can understand that because I've had my own medical experiences and I've had my own problems going to the doctor so I understand uh, why he didn't I also understand that food tastes delicious um, and you know and, and, and I don't know but but I uh, but but again it, it really affected me it had a um, uh, you know it, it, it you know you know it, it makes me, you know, when I when I when I see people going down that road, I just sort of see Bill. So that's why, I, you know, am sort of uncompromising in promoting good health and health and heart health, um, knowing that that's not like a, um, it's it's not a perfect solution. That like a lot of this is genetic and things like that too. So I mean, you know, you just never know. Like I don't know. Maybe maybe there was nothing Bill could have done. I don't know, but you know, it still it still makes me very. Um, affected when I when I see people uh, because you know again we're so um, 
we're so given to that in the hobby. Um, but yeah, I mean, he really was a tremendous person. Um, the phrase that always kept getting thrown at me when I would talk about Bill with people at the funeral, or it was a memorial service, um, were, um, uh, was salt of the earth, which I think really encapsulates the type of person he was. Um, and yeah, so again, I don't want to, I don't want to meander too much. Um, you know, again, I, I do this every year. I, I try to make a point of doing this in one form or another. And, you know, I, I would encourage other people if they knew Bill to say something kind about him during this period. Um, you know, he, he, he was not anybody I ever had an issue with. We would have debates. We would have, you know, the kind of debates that gamers have about things. Um, but if anything ever got even close to being personal, he was always the type of person who would put the brakes on it. Um, you know, and I'm, and I'm not trying to paint him in an overly uh, saintly light here. He could get into... I, I've seen him get into to, to very uh, heated debates and get very upset over things. So I don't want to paint him like he has like this calm monk who never had emotions. But I just mean if he and I were involved in a discussion... And he could sense that um, that I was upset about something. He would show empathy, you know, more often than not. I remember him, uh, you know, really surprising me in some discussions and showing a lot of, like, understanding that I didn't see from most other people. Um, and so I always viewed him kind of like a brother. Um, and, and, yeah, so it's, it's, it's you know, it's very... Uh, it's still very sad um, and, and again I'm kind of on the border of going to cry about this this time so I'm just going to end it here but, uh, but yeah I, I hope people will, will, will take time and if they knew him just say something nice about him because he, he was a really nice person and, and he, uh, he's someone that I still have a, a lot of um, a lot of memories of, of learning things from which continues to surprise me. It re I mean, again, it, it really equipped me uh, in ways I didn't expect after he passed away. And sorry, I'll, I'll leave it there, and until next time, I'll talk to you later.